We're going to be talking tonight about the federal land grab, the property that the federal government claims to have title to, claims to control, claims to own, and rule that it is more than 640 million acres. That's a lot of land around America. What I hope we accomplish is these four things. First of all, I want us to look at the constitutional issues at stake in the federal government claiming to own and control vast tracts of land in our country. Then I want us to look at the history of that. And the history primarily is examined by looking at the enabling acts. Those are the acts that uh, Congress passed laying the path for each state to join the Union, other than the first 13 states. And then we're going to look at the problems associated with federal land ownership, not just the constitutional problems, but the practical problems that many states are experiencing in terms of federal land ownership. And then finally, I want us to look at solutions. And I want to encourage you tonight that not only are solutions possible, but we are seeing around the country various states taking up the actions that are necessary to put the federal leviathan back into the box uh, that our Constitution created for it. Our founders, and you can read this design by looking at Federalist Paper number 45, the design of our founders is that the, is that the federal government would have very few and limited powers, and the state governments would have very large and wide-ranging powers. In fact, they said that your rights to life, liberty, and property were going to be better protected by your state government than they were by your federal government. ...of where most of our state legislatures are, not just Maryland, but all over the country. They've never even held a copy of their state constitution, let alone cracked it open and began to study what it contains, in spite of the fact that each one of them has taken an oath before Almighty God, endangering their immortal soul to abide by and obey this state constitution. And uh, one of our hosts, who's been hosting for a number of years, uh, the U.S. class, came to me and he said, David, I took your challenge to study our California state constitution. I said, look right here, David, look at what it says here. And I agreed, that is a violation of the structure of our very government. That is a violation. That gives permission for the federal government to own land within the state of California right there in their constitution. He said, I don't know how I can teach this because this document, our, our California state constitution, is in violation of the federal constitution and is allowing the federal government to continue to abuse the state of California. And he said the, the fact of the matter is, he went back to look at the original. That wasn't the original constitution of the state of California. He looked at the original constitution and he discovered the same phrasing there in the original constitution. So he said, wait a minute, something's happened here. It appears that the state of California came into the federal union on illegitimate grounds. That the, the pretense that the federal government was accepting them on was a false premise. And you'll see that California was admitted in the year 19, or excuse me, 1850. And so uh, knowing that 1850 was a year where they were admitted, I went back and looked at the, uh, uh, the documents that preceded its admission. There was two enabling acts that uh, were proposed in Congress. And I looked at the language of those enabling acts as well as the language of the first Constitution of California and discovered, wait a minute, Congress was approving of this language in the state Constitution of California that's an actual violation of the U.S. Constitution. What is happening? By the year 1850, our Congress was violating the law. Wow. Looking at those issues. And so let's look at the constitutional issues regarding federal ownership and control of any land whatsoever in these sovereign United States. Article 1, Section 8. If you know nothing else about the U.S. Constitution, if you don't have any other part of it memorized, this would be the part to memorize because this list of 18 things gives us the restrictions, gives us the boundaries within which our federal government is to operate. You want to know the limitations on their power? There they are. Article 1, Section 8 lists them very clearly, and that uh, begins with Clause 1, Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excise, and then goes on after that with this list. We're going to jump down in the list because we're interested in Clause 17, which reads, to exercise, Congress has power to exercise legis exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district, not exceeding 10 miles square, as may by succession of particular states and acceptance of Congress become the seat of government of the United States. 
That's Washington, D.C., the 10 square miles of Washington, D.C. They exercise exclusive legislation over that district. And then it continues, and to exercise like authority, like the authority they have over the District of Columbia, exercise like authority over all places purchased by the consent of the legislature of the state in which the same shall be for the erection, five, five purposes, for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings. Very clearly here, the federal government is told it can only own property within the sovereign boundaries of any state in the Union if the state legislature permits them to purchase that property, and if the purchase of that property is only for these five reasons, to build a fort, a magazine, arsenal, dockyard, or other needful buildings. Now, if we continue and ask, well, what is the power that they are basing upon in their mind they're basing upon the control of more, more than 640 million acres in these United States. If you read the apologists, those who defend this control of that land, they'll take you to Article 4 of our Constitution, particularly Article 4, Section 3. New states may be admitted by the Congress into the Union. This is the power of the Congress to admit new states into the Union, to choose which states can be admitted, to set up the process by which they are admitted, which is usually the process of an enabling act. New states may be admitted by the Congress into the Union, but no new states may be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state, nor any state be formed by the jurisdiction of two or more states or parts of states without the consent of the legislatures of the states concerned as well as that of Congress. If you look now, Section 3 continues of Article 4, that Congress shall have power to dispose of, and this is where they gain their rationale for why the federal government can own all of this land and control all of this land, that Congress shall have power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory. Notice that word. We're not talking here about states, we're talking about territories. Territories are land that has not yet gone through the process of being admitted as a state in the Union. So until it becomes a state, the territory is under these rules of Article 4, Section 3. That they have the power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States, and nothing in this Constitution shall be con so construed as to prejudice any claims of the United States or of any particular state. Yes, Congress does have power over territories, but not that power over states themselves. Now, when Congress is in the process of deciding whether a uh, proposed state will come into the Union or not come into the Union, Article 4, Section 4, tells us the standard they are to use in that. The United States shall guarantee to every state in this Union a Republican form of government. The battles that took place in Congress resulted in what's called the Missouri Compromise, this line drawn all across the country that says, with the exception of Missouri, Missouri is the only state that's going to come into the Union above this line as a slave state. All the other states that are slave states have to be below this line. Missouri is the exception. So this was the Missouri Compromise that was uh, uh, reached as Missouri came into the Union in 1821 and set a standard for free states above that and uh, slave states below that. So it tells you the Missouri Compromise didn't work all, out all that well because Kansas is actually above that line, and there was a great battle that took place. Well, coming ahead to California, which we began to talk about, if you notice where that line intersects California, it's just about the midway point. So half of California is below the line, half of California is above the line. And the reason the first two enabling acts never, never made it through Congress is there was such contention as to whether California would enter as a free state or whether it would enter as a slave state. Ultimately, it was decided to slice off what's now uh, Nevada as well as Utah, and the Utah Territory would not become part of the state of California as it entered the Union uh, in 1850. So when we look at the issues involved in federal property ownership throughout the country, the issues really have to do with how states came into the Union uh, in that day. We've already seen what Article 4, Section 3 says, that Congress does have power 
does have power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting a territory. The first time Congress began to act unconstitutionally in relationship to a state that was coming into the Union to say that some of the land in that state would remain under the control and under the ownership of the federal government even after that state came into the Union and was a sovereign state within the Union. And so this re first thing to understand is where the property came from that ultimately became more than just the 13 states in the Union. You see, those 13 states in the Union like to think that they had an extensive Western territory. In fact, most of the original 13 states in one way, shape, or form claimed their Western lands extended all the way to the Mississippi River. Brought about in the Articles of Confederation, which you remember, after the Declaration of Independence was signed, the government that was formed, the central government or the federal government, was under the Articles of Confederation. And it took a while for the various new states to actually ratify the Articles of Confederation. They didn't do it all at once. It was a number of years before they were all uh, in agreement to ratify this. And in the ratification of the Articles of Confederation, an agreement was reached for these states to cede their western lands, the lands that they claimed that they controlled all the way out uh, to the Mississippi, Mississippi River. And so you could say the temporary federal ownership of land began with the Articles of Confederation, saying there's land that the federal government is going to control temporarily in preparation for those lands to eventually become states. That was the only purpose for this temporary uh, cession of land uh, to the federal government's control. 40% of the western lands, there was a large section of land that was ceded to the federal government, 237 million acres between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River between 18, uh, 1781 and, and 1802. That, and so we see that the western boundaries of those first 13 states became fixed as a result of the Articles of Confederation and the agreements that were entered into uh, by the people of those states. In the War of 1812, when Britain basically surrendered its claims, it said that what became the Northwest Territory was the territory of the United States. So a large section of land came under the control of the federal government. It came under control of the federal government for the sole purpose of preparing these lands ultimately to move uh, towards statehood. It was not something that was going to be permanently controlled uh, by uh, the federal government for these United States or perhaps even purchase of New Orleans. The amazing thing is Napoleon said, have I got a deal for you? <laughs> I'm not just going to sell you New Orleans. I want to sell you this whole Louisiana purchase. You're going to get a huge tract of land, in fact, doubling the size uh, of the United States in, in terms of land mass. And Jefferson jumped at this, but then he kind of paused. He said, hmm, is this constitutional? And he wrestled with it so much so that he actually drafted an amendment to the Constitution that would permit the federal government to purchase this large tract of land. It's an interesting kind of purchase agreement because only part of a small part of it involved actual cash that went to Napoleon Bonaparte. The largest part of this purchase was an agreement that the debts owed to American citizens uh, by the French government, by Napoleon Bonaparte and his government, would be transferred to the U.S. government. So it's just a debt swap in a sense that was uh, proposed as part of this Louisiana uh, purchase. Jefferson was thinking in the direction of amending the Constitution and then he recognized that's going to take too long. That's going to involve a lengthy process, and by the time we reach the end of that goal, we will probably have lost it altogether. So instead of going the route of a constitutional amendment, he proposed a treaty, and the treaty very quickly sailed through the Senate. They all agreed, this is a great deal, let's go ahead and purchase that. And so because Congress, through the Senate and the President, are granted the treaty-making power, they move forward in purchasing uh, this vast tract of land in purchase uh, in 1867 of Alaska, what many people in that day called Seward's Folly by this huge, vast tract of frozen wilderness that it was, in their minds, of absolutely no value at all. It turns out to be an extremely valuable purchase. So that's the history of the expansion. And again, these temporary, they were designed to be temporary purchases and nothing other than temporary purchases in advance of preparing those territories so that they could move towards statehood. It was never intended that the federal government would own or control any of those lands in the ultimate sense of that word. 
temporary ownership, just to give a summary of, of what, that, whoop, what that looked like. The Louisiana Purchase was 53 million, uh, 530 million acres. Then another track in Britain and Spain, 76 million acres. Substantial acquisitions of 620 million acres through treaties of 1846, 1853, and then uh, Alaska, 378 million acres. Now, those who reject the constitutional vision of limited federal powers do not like this idea that the Constitution limits the federal government's uh, ownership of land. And those who reject, therefore, the constitutional interpretation of our founders, they claim, and I'm quoting one of them here, the means by which the federal government came to own lands can affect which laws govern the management of that land. And so a set of our, our first 13 colonies, obviously, they became states by declaring independence from England. They joined the Union independently, each one of those 13 choosing to ratify the Articles of Confederation, then ratify the Constitution. That was one means of admission. But most of the rest of our country was first purchased by the federal government. And so the apologists for the federal land grab would claim that because the federal government purchased these lands, therefore those lands belong to the federal government and it can dispose of them how it chooses. The laws governing them differ than the laws that govern uh, the, uh, the other states. And so this would mean that states who joined the union formed from those territories purchased by the federal government, acquired those in the, way, in the fashion that they were acquired. Therefore, there is a different set of standards for them in terms of federal government controlling or owning land within their boundaries, as opposed to, say, the first 13 states that joined the Union, because they joined without any federal ownership of their lands before they came into the Union. But this would mean that there's a two-tier system in America. There's states who joined under one system, that the federal government had not purchased the land at all, and then there's those who the federal government did purchase the land, and therefore they are more under the thumb of the federal government than the other states. This two-tiered structure is what the apologists of the federal land grab will tell you is law in America today. And these are not small folks. These are folks who inhabit the highest levels of power in Washington, D.C., whether in the executive branch or the legislative branch or certainly in the judicial branch as well question we have for them, as we do for every issue, is where in the text of the Constitution is there permission to do what you say the federal government has permission to do? Where is the justification for the federal government owning any land other than land that meets the Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 restrictions on federal property ownership? Uh, I think justly called the father of our Constitution, James Madison said, uh, and he said on paper, because his first draft of the Constitution was what they were debating over, in his first draft of the Constitution, notice the wording he used regarding new states being admitted to the Union. If admission be consented to, that is a new state is consented to join the Union, if admission be consented to, new states shall be admitted on the same terms with the original states. That's pretty clear. He even got uh, uh, more vociferous when he insisted that the Western states neither would nor ought to submit to a union which degraded them from an equal rank with the other states. George Mason said the following. George Mason said, if the Western states are to be admitted to the union, they must be treated as equals and subject to no degrading discrimination they will have the same pride and other passions which we have and will either not unite with or will speedily revolt from the Union if they are not in all respects placed on an equal footing with their brethren. And that phrase, equal footing, caught hold because that's how the founders interpreted the idea of a new state coming into the Union. They would come in on an equal footing, and that began to be talked about as the equal footing doctrine. And even the Supreme Court, before it became corrupted, recognized this equal footing doctrine. For example, this case which, uh, in the city of Chicago in 1883 said the doctrine, that is the equal footing doctrine, uh, means that equality of constitutional right and power is the condition of all states of the Union, old and new. So they recognized the debate. 
did the old states come in under a different deal than the new states? They said, no, no, everybody came under the exact same deal. And so this term, equal footing doctrine, uh, also appears in almost all of the state enabling acts that we have studied. They include this phrase quite often in most of those. Sometimes there's a slight variation in the phrase, but the enabling acts generally say, into the union on an equal footing. This state is being admitted into the union on an equal footing with the original states in all respects whatsoever. And to look and search for 37, we only found 28. Oddly enough, that's because nine states actually joined the union without an enabling act at all. Vermont, Kentucky, Tennessee, Arkansas, uh, Michigan, Florida, Kansas, Idaho, and Wyoming. And so this equal footing doctrine, the U.S. Supreme Court has clarified in other cases that in the context of land, the equal footing doctrine has been held to mean, for example, that states have authority over the beds of nav navigable waterways. Think about that. It may be not an issue that you ever thought about. Who owns the bed under the Chesapeake? Who owns and controls that bed of land underneath the Chesapeake? It's underwater. Or how about the Potomac River? Or mention any body of water. Well, the Congress understood that when they bring a state into the Union, the navigable waterways in that state are under the control and owned by that state and are no longer under the control or the ownership of Congress. And this was a Supreme Court case, Pollard's Lisi v. Hagen, uh, back in 1848, where they essentially say that the doctrine and some of the language within this Supreme Court case provides an argument that the federal government held the lands ceded by the original states only temporarily pending their disposal. And in the West, there are people in extreme distress because of things that the federal government is attempting to do to them. This past December, I guess as a Christmas present, it was December 22nd, Ken Salazar, Department of Interior Secretary, signed this secretarial order number 3310. And basically, it's an order that would lock up millions upon millions of Western lands that are currently owned by the federal government, but ranchers are allowed to graze their cattle there, timber companies are allowed to cut timber there, mining companies are allowed to mine. There's all these kind of uh, arrangements where the land can be used by those who are making a living in the western states. And the proposal for Obama and his gang is to lock up these and create wilderness areas that are closed. If they're closed to motor vehicles, that means you can't go snowmobiling on them. You can't you know, take a two-wheeler, you can't take a three-wheeler. The only people that can go in is by foot. So obviously, there's no economic activity going to happen in these closed lands, millions and millions of acres. That's just one of an illustration of many, many problems that are occurring, especially in the Western lands, as they face economic hard times with the rest of us. And what they have is the federal government proposing to lock up the resources, claiming, hey, we own this, we control this, and therefore you're not able to use this. I always thought it peculiar. Haven't you seen these signs? No trespassing. State property. Excuse me. State pro Who is the state? It's you and I who have compacted together to form a constitution. That form and so when we took a look at Ohio's Enabling Act, I was very surprised that this early in the history of our country, back in 1803, this is what the Congress was already saying. Section 1 just says that uh, the state shall be admitted into this union, into the union upon the same footing with the original states in all respects whatsoever. Good, okay, that's a good start. But then it goes on in Section 7, say, in the third part of Section 7, 120 is part of the net proceeds of the lands lying within the said state sold by Congress from and after the 30th day of June next. And if you compare your calendar dates, you discover 30th day June next was 1803, three months after the state of Ohio was admitted into the Union. So three months after they were admitted to the Union, what's Congress doing? Congress is still selling land within the sovereign boundaries of the state of of Ohio, and notice what it says it's going to do. After deducting all expenses incident to the same, that's incident to selling the land, uh, shall be applied to the laying out and making public roads leading from the navigable waters emptying into the Atlantic to the Ohio, uh, to the said state, and through the same such roads to be laid out under the authority of Congress. Well, the authority of Congress laying out roads. Making money off of selling land 
taking that money after all of its expenses were paid and then using that money to build roads in the state of Ohio based upon Congress's decision as to where and how those roads were going to be. Well, if I read Article 1, Section 8, and you ought to read it carefully, you'll see that, yes, Congress does have power to make roads, but only post roads. And if you notice the language here describing the roads that uh, the federal government is going to build in the state of Ohio, they are not post roads. They're not specifically anything to do with postal. It's more like we're going to create a transportation system to all the navigable rivers in the state of Ohio. And then it provided always that the three foregoing propositions here and offered are on the condition that the convention of the said state, that is Ohio, shall provide by an ordinance irrevocable. They're going to lay down a law that can never be changed according to them. Irrevocable law that each tract of land sold by Congress from and after the 30th day of June next, that's after three months after they became a state, uh, after June next, uh, shall be and remain exempt from any tax laid by uh, the order, order or under the authority of the state, whether for state, county, township, or any other purpose, whatever, for the term of five years from and after the date of sale. So not only is Congress saying how it's going to spend the money that it, it obtains from the sale of this property, it's telling the state of Ohio it cannot tax the property in that state for five years for anyone who has purchased property from the federal government. Where in the Constitution does the federal government have the power to do this? Nowhere. Nowhere at all. And so that puzzled me. And I read some of the other uh, responses because the convention in Ohio responded to the enabling act of the federal government. So, okay, well, you say this. Here's what we say. And notice what they say in response. We do uh, resolve to accept of the said propositions provided the following additions to and modifications of the said propositions shall be agreed to by the Congress that not less than 3% of the net proceeds of the land of the United States lying within the limits of the state of Ohio sold and to be sold after the 30th day of June uh, last shall be applied in laying uh, out of roads within the state. Congress has said 5%, they said 3%. They're just dickering over the details. They are not recognizing that what Congress is doing here is completely unconstitutional. The Congress is violating the law in the very enabling act that it's proposing by which Ohio would become a state in our union. The Northwest Ordinance, a very famous document that the, the Congress enacted before our Constitution was ratified. Section 4 of that says the legislatures of those district or, or new states shall never interfere with the primary disposal of the soil by the United States in Congress assembled nor with any regulations Congress may find necessary for securing the title in such soil to the bona fide purchasers. No tax shall be imposed on lands, the property of the United States. There's where the idea came from that the Congress was following in the Enabling Act for Ohio. They were taking the words of the Northwest Ordinance and say, hey, this is the law that we will follow. Notice what it goes on to say in Section 5 of the Northwest Ordinance. And any of the said states shall have 60,000 free inhabitants therein, such state shall be admitted by its delegates into the Congress of the United States on an equal footing with the original states in all respects. Excuse me? In all respects? Equal footing? No. They're saying they're going to control land and they're going to sell land in that state. That's not the equal footing in which the first 13 states entered the Union. Or Then it goes on to say, and shall be at liberty to form a permanent constitution and state government, provided the constitution and government be so formed, shall be republican and in conformity to the principles. So what was taking place in Congress there at the turn, at the beginning of the 19th century, was that they were taking the law called the Northwest Ordinance as superior to the constitution. And in spite of the fact that the Constitution said they cannot do this, they were doing it in accordance with the Northwest Ordinance. And so that raises the question, which came first, the chicken or the egg, right? <laughs> which came first, the Northwest Ordinance, look at the date for the Northwest Ordinance, July 13th, 1787. What was happening July 13th, 1787 in Philadelphia? Oh, there was a group of men gathered, 55 men gathered. They were in the heat of the summer of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. While in New York, Congress was meeting, and Congress passed and ratified the Northwest Ordinance, July 13th. And our U.S. Constitution obviously wasn't signed until September 17th, and obviously it wasn't even valid law at that point. It was just proposed to Congress, and then Congress would pass it on to the states. And we know that when the ninth state, New Hampshire, ratified that Constitution on June 21st, 1788, the Constitution became effective for the first time. So look at the dates there. 
Northwest Ordinance, 1787. Ratification of the Constitution, 1788. Which is the supreme law of the land? Well, you know what the Constitution says, that the supreme law of the land is the Constitution of the United States and the laws made in pursuance thereof. That is the laws that are constitutional. And so the Northwest Ordinance can be reckoned with but must be evaluated by the Constitution for its provisions to be uh, legal in our state. A great tract of land. And notice what it says in the Enabling Act for the state of Louisiana. Section 3 says, and provided also that the said convention, that's the convention in Louisiana, shall provide by ordinance irrevocable, here's this language again, irrevocable without the consent of the United States, that the people inhabiting the said territory do agree and declare that they forever disclaim all right or title to the waste or unappropriated lands lying within the said territory. What? an irrevocable law that they will forever give up any claim to lands that have not been deeded to a specific individual or claimed by the state of Louisiana in one way, shape, or form, all the, quote, waste land or unappropriated land. Uh, and then it goes on, and that the same, that waste land, shall be and remain at the sole and entire disposition of the United States. And moreover, that each and every tract of land sold by Congress shall be and remain exempt from any tax laid for the term of five years from and after the respective days of the sale thereof. So Louisiana, they were expressing it even more forcefully than they were uh, in, the, in the enabling act of the state of Ohio. And it says, and be further enacted that 5% of the net proceeds of the sales of the lands of the United States after the first day of January 1812 shall be applied to laying out and constructing public roads and levees in the said state as the legislature may direct. That's the What is going on? The federal government is acting unconstitutionally, and it's forcing the states as they come into the union, you abide by our unconstitutional agreement, or we won't let you into the union. Or Wyoming. Wyoming was so bold as to, uh, and I like this attitude, but perhaps it uh, not, was not appropriate then. They were so bold to say, we don't even need an enabling act. We're just going to form a convention here in Wyoming. We're going to propose a constitution and basically going to demand that Congress accept us as a state. It's essentially what Wyoming uh, did in, in their uh, uh, attempt, and they were successful in, in becoming uh, a state in the Union. There's also some fascinating stories there about what was taking place politically. The state of Nevada actually was rushed through the enabling process in order to get the 16th president reelected. That's right. They wanted enough electoral votes there, counting noses and figuring out, say, oh yeah, if we get Nevada in very quickly here, we could be sure that the 16th the tyrant will be uh, re-elected, and, and so he was and thus far. And uh, Section 1 speaks in similar language, that being enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America and Congress assembled that subject to the provisions of this act and upon the issuance of proclamation required by Section 8C, 8C of this act, the state of Alaska is hereby declared to be a state of the United States of America, is declared admitted into the Union on an equal footing with the other states in all respects, whatever, and the Constitution formed pursuant to the provision of the Act of the Territorial Legislature of Alaska uh, entitled an act to provide for the holding of a constitutional convention to prepare for a constitution for the state of Alaska to submit the constitution to the people for adoption or rejection to prepare for the admission of Alaska as a state to make appropriation and setting an effective date and so on. Adopted by a vote of the people of Alaska, uh, April 24th, 1956, and hereby found to be a Republican in form and conformity with the Constitution of the United States and the principles of the Declaration of Independence, and is hereby accepted, ratified, and confirmed. I like that. They not only say it's in complete harmony with our Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, but also with the principles of the Declaration of Independence. That's good. Great start. And then we turn to uh, Section 6 of Alaska Statehood Act. And I'll jump uh, over that section. The state of Alaska, in addition to many other grants made in this section, is hereby granted and shall be entitled to select within 25 years after the admission of the state into the Union not to exceed 102,550,000 uh, acres from the public lands of the United States in Alaska, which are vacant, unappropriated, and reserve, unreserved at the time of their selection provided that nothing herein contained shall affect in any valid existing claim, location, or entry under the laws of the United States, and so on and so forth. And so they were saying, we're going to be very generous to the state of Alaska. And you think of that, that's a huge tract of land, 102 million acres, but consider the total land mass of Alaska. The total land mass of Alaska is 424 
520 acres, and the gift that the federal government was saying the state of Alaska could have this gift, the gift of 102,550,000 acres is really only 24% of the state. In other words, the federal government said, we own just about everything, and in our great largesse, we're going to give you this portion, 24% of the state you can have. The rest of it belongs to us. We are in control of all that enormous tract of land. And so you can see the change in attitude from Louisiana and Ohio. There's some tentativeness about what they're doing in the land grab. But by the time it comes to Alaska, it's like, no, 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 we control all of this, and we're going to parcel out to you uh, what we choose and that, that chart there, the gray area is what's owned and controlled by the federal government, and the rest uh, belongs to state or uh, individual property owners. Now, if you compare, Alaska it really isn't the worst of the states in terms of the amount of federal government grab and control. You can see the worst is the state of Nevada. And you could see very clearly that the percentage of land claimed to be owned and controlled by the federal government is predominantly in the western states. In fact, if we were just to chart it out this way, you'll see Nevada is the worst there with 84.5% of its land uh, claimed to be owned and controlled. Alaska, 69%, Utah, 57%, and, and so on down the list. But the vast majority of federal lands are controlled in the western states, which is why the battles that have taken place politically have primarily been in the West, where those people are directly affected, their livelihoods are endangered by changes in uh, federal regulation. Let's go back just for a moment and remind ourselves of what the meaning of the admission clause is in our Constitution, Article 4, Section 3. New states may be admitted by Congress into this union. What did they mean by that? They meant admitted on an equal footing with all the states that already had joined the union, not second-class citizens because they came in late, or this property clause of our U.S. Constitution, Article 4, Section 3, Congress shall have power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory. This is not respecting a state. It's respecting a territory and not a state. And so what we have in today's reality is the federal government locking up enormous tracts of land, in fact, proposing to lock up even more tracts of land. I've, there's a whole number of articles. If you just uh, uh, Google federal land grab, you'll find many, many things that are taking place uh, today. For example, in uh, Florida, the federal government dictates how land is going to be used by people in Florida, even on private property. For example, they uh, are moving, the federal government wants to control the use of 150,000 acres of private property north of Lake Okeechobee, designating this as a wildlife refuge, even though it's private property. And so they're appropriating 700 million tax dollars to buy 50,000 of the 150,000 acres so that they can secure conservation easements on the remaining 100,000 acres that are privately owned to tell the people who own that property how they're going to uh, farm the property, how they're going to use the property, they're going to control it. And what's their justification? Well, that's the headwaters of the Everglades. And if so, if, if a landowner does something up in that uh, headwaters of the Everglades that pollutes the water, it's going to affect the Everglades. And because the Everglades is a national park, we, the federal government, have the right to protect this national park, and therefore the headwaters, the, the water feeds into this national park, we can claim control of that even though it's held in private hands and is not public land. Out in Utah, the Department of the Interior has issued, as I mentioned, this Secretarial Order Number 3310, and uh, it is designed to take control of federal lands to permit nothing to be done with it in terms of uh, grazing, mining, uh, logging, or even certain activities that just the average uh, individual wants to get an out off-road vehicle or things like that will be restricted. They are not permitted to take place. So many of the western states are recognizing they have a leviathan in Washington, D.C., dictating the use of land in their state. The worst of states is really Nevada. Nevada, huge tracts of land. This chart here shows the percentage in each county that the federal land owns, the federal government owns, and the least of these is 40%. That is the county right there around uh, Las Vegas. 40% of the land in that county is controlled and owned, quote, unquote, owned by the federal government. This is all unconstitutional. This is all against the design our founders crafted for us in terms of a limited federal government. So the question is, what can we do about this? What should we do about this? Well, there are solutions, and the solutions are primarily these, these two words, nullification and interposition. 
you've been here before, you've known Michael has taught an excellent uh, DVD on interposition. We've had others teach on nullification. Nullification is to say a federal law that is unconstitutional is null and void. And the state has a responsibility to recognize that federal law is null and void. You talk to most legislators in Annapolis, and you ask them, what are you going to do this uh, legislative session? You won't hear one of them. Well, maybe there's one or two that would even peep the idea that they might nullify something that the federal government does. There are other states that are moving in this direction, talking about nullifying Obamacare or things of that nature. But nullification is what states are charged with doing, protecting us when the federal government acts outside of its charter, acts outside of its constitution. Interposition is for them to take an active role in protecting us from unlawful actions on the part of the federal government. And praise God, there's some states that are getting this. For example, the state of Utah, legislation approved with the House and voted 61 to 9, uh, state jurisdiction of federally managed lands joint resolution. It's a resolution, which means it's not, doesn't have the teeth of a law, but it's putting the federal government on notice regarding uh, these federally managed lands. And notice some of the language uh, that is proposed in this resolution. Be it resolved that the legislature of the state of Utah calls on the United States through their agent Congress to relinquish to the state of Utah all right, title, and jurisdiction in those lands that were committed to the purpose of, purposes of this state by terms of its enabling act, compact with them, with Congress, and that now reside within the state as public lands managed by the Bureau of Land Management that were reserved by Congress after the date of Utah statehood. So they realize they're looking back to the Enabling Act, but the Enabling Act for Utah has some of the same problems that we've looked at already with Alaska or the other state enabling acts that grant the federal government control of power over land that they do not constitutionally have power over. Uh, other solutions, actually this uh, particular piece of legislation continues. The federal trust respecting public lands obligates the United States through their agent Congress to extinguish both their governmental jurisdiction and their title on the public lands that are held in trust by the United States for the states in which they are located. So they understand and they're appealing to Congress to extinguish its claim to own this property within the boundaries of the state of Utah. It continues, and if this is not done, the resolution said, the state is denied the same complete and independent sovereignty and jurisdiction that was expressly retained by the original states, and its citizens are denied the political right to establish or administer their own Republican self-governance, as is their right under the equal footing clause. They've got it right in terms of the basis. The only thing that I might criticize them on is they're making a resolution. Rather than just acting and saying, no, 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 we're going to take this land back. It does not belong to the federal government. But this is a very good first step on the part of a state that is recognizing that they have a duty to nullify and interpose unconstitutional actions. Well, let's look at some other aspects of this. The resolution explains that the use of the more than 22 million acres at issue have been eroded by an oppressive and overreaching federal management agenda that has adversely impacted the sovereignty and the economics of the state of Utah and local government. That the Department of Interior has arbitrarily created a new category of lands denominated wild lands and has superimposed these mandatory protective management provisions upon Bureau of Land Management operations and planning decisions in violation of the provisions of the Federal Land Policy Management Act and the provisions of the Administrative Procedures Act and the Pres Presidential Executive Order 13563. So they're recognizing that the federal government is breaking its own laws in violation of its own laws, and I applaud them for this. And I pray that they and other states will take up the mantle and go beyond a simple resolution and say, no, no, we need to declare that these lands no longer belong to the United States federal government as uh, it claims. In fact, they could put some teeth into such a law, uh, like what the state of Texas has done. Well, I shouldn't say it was done. It was, it's a proposed piece of legislation that is moving through. A bill's been pre-filed, a state legislative session, uh, creating penalties up to $5,000 in fines, up to five years in jail for anyone guilty of the felony of attempting to enforce 
an act, order, law, statute, rule, regulation of Obamacare. If they attempt to do this, we're going to fine them, arrest them, put them in jail. That's what should happen. States should recognize the Constitution says, and the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. And any action on the federal government to do otherwise, we need to nullify that. In fact, we need to interpose, and one interposition would be to arrest federal agents who are acting unconstitutionally, acting unlawfully. So I applaud Texas. I don't know that HB 506 is the transfer management of certain federal public lands, gives the federal government 90 days notice, put them on 90 days notice, to prove that the federal government's claim to Montana land meets the constitutional requirements of Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, or the land will be claimed by the state of Montana. I applaud Montana. They're doing the right thing. <laughs> Putting the federal government on notice that they're in violation of the supreme law of the land and that job of the state governments is to see that the federal government stops being a lawbreaker. We need to do that. We need to do that here in the state of Maryland, although perhaps we have a more difficult time achieving that. Well, let's look at some of the other pieces of legislation being considered. It. Oddly enough, all of these are western states where some of these battles are heating up. The Wyoming legislation, HB 95, includes the principle that if passed would impose penalties for violations of the law. Any official, it says, or agent employee of the United States government who enforces or attempts to enforce an act, order, law, statute, rule, regulation of the United States government upon the personal firearm. So this is a firearm issue, not a land issue. Firearm issue. A firearm accessory or ammunition that is manufactured commercially or privately in Wyoming and that remains exclusively within the boundaries, borders of Wyoming, shall be guilty of a felony and upon conviction shall be subject to imprisonment, not for more than two years, fine of not more than $10,000 or both. I like that, or both, you know. We need to put the federal government on notice. When it breaks the law, it cannot get away with breaking the law. But you and I as individual citizens, oh, we can call our congressmen and fax our congressmen, do all these things that we should be doing. But ultimately, they tend to ignore us, right? I've had friends that have gone down there to Washington to try to meet and talk with our representatives. And, pff, they pay no attention to them. But, yeah, we need re new representatives. But if the states begin to take action like this, putting the federal government on notice that when it violates the law, they, the states, have an obligation to be, in a sense, the, con the, the constitutional police force. You violate the law, at least within our jurisdiction, the boundaries of our state, we're going to make you pay for it. We're going to penalize you. We're going to make it hurt so that you learn the lesson. You cannot get away breaking the supreme law of the land. So what should a state do if a state were to say, we need to take action and prepare ourselves to nullify unconstitutional actions on the part of the federal government. I think they need to establish constitutional grounds for state nullification. In other words, in law they need to make it very clear we are acting legally. We are acting within the boundaries of the U.S. Constitution and the Constitution of our state and we are not acting unlawfully, which is obviously the claim that the federal government is making about all these western states. In fact, uh, it's called often called the Sagebrush Rebellion. Back in the uh, uh, political campaign of Ronald Reagan leading up to his first run for the White House, he identified himself with those rebels out west who were saying the federal government is completely out of control. Uh, we are staging a sagebrush rebellion, is what it was called. And he identified himself with that. And when he got into office, he appointed uh, uh, was it Babbitt, I believe it was, to Interior Secretary. And some monkeying and tinkering with the federal regulations took place to kind of ease the burden on those western states. And so many of the people declared victory. The Sagebrush Rebellion was a victory because the federal government is not regulating us so severely as it was before. But the tyrant was back, and by the 1990s, there was what was often termed the second Sagebrush Rebellion, that many of the western states were, again, faced, Utah, Nevada, others, faced with all kinds of uh, unconstitutional actions uh, of the federal government. I remember Nye County, uh, Nevada, uh, the County commissioners determined that the roads being closed by the Bureau of Land Management, Bureau of Land Management put up a sign, nobody's going to use this road anymore. So wait a minute, this is not theirs to do. They issued a resolution that said this, this land really belongs to the state of Nevada, and therefore we as the county commissioners are going to use that road. And they bulldozed, and oh, there was a big standoff, and you know, kind of a battle that took place. Another battle that took place there was that Bureau of Land Management was telling a rancher that he couldn't graze his cattle on a certain uh, track of Bureau of Land Management land. And uh, the rancher continued to do it. And so the Bureau of Land Management told the sheriff of that county 
that they were going to go in and seize the cattle of this rancher. The sheriff, knowing his duty as a sheriff, said to them, no, you're not. You're not going to do that. That is theft, and I will not permit you to steal the property of someone in my county, my jurisdiction as the sheriff. Uh, they, they issued back a uh, demand that he you know, cease and desist and back off and let them come, and basically he said to them, okay, you want it? Bring on the lead. We'll meet you with lead. And you know what happened? The Bureau of Land Management backed down and did not steal the county because one sheriff understood his sworn duty as the highest law enforcement officer in that county to protect his citizens against a federal government that is violating the law. And you see, that's the interposition, where the lesser magistrate stands against the higher magistrate and says, you're in violation of the law. I will not permit you to be in violation of the law, at least in my jurisdiction. For the sheriff, it's the county. For the state government, it is the state uh, that has that jurisdiction. And so they can establish the constitutional grounds for state nullification. They can and should establish a swift method for nullification of any unconstitutional federal act, past, present, or future, so that they're prepared that as soon as an unconstitutional act is issued by, as an edict by Washington, D.C., they respond swiftly and say, no, that is null, that is not law, at least within the jurisdiction of our state. They can establish and should establish that only the U.S. Supreme Court has original jurisdiction under Article Three of the U.S. Constitution. In other words, saying, no, we're not going to recognize many of the Supreme Court decisions, because while I read the decisions of the Supreme Court that were correct in terms of the equal footing doctrine, guess what? The Supreme Court did a 180 since then, and now issues rulings regularly supporting everything the federal government is doing in terms of the land grab uh, around our country. And so issuing statements that we won't recognize these unconstitutional acts on the part of the Supreme Court when they rule unconstitutionally. Another thing a state can do is establish that the people, not the courts, the people have the final word. The courts are not the final interpreters of the Constitution, whether state constitution or federal constitution, which is why we exist at Institute on the Constitution. We recognize it's going to take many, many Marylanders and many, many Americans who understand what is law before we can rein in the tyrant and prevent him from acting tyrannically any longer. They can establish and should establish a very limited role of the power of the federal government under the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. And this will mean some sacrifice because once a state puts the federal government on notice, the federal government has the power of the purse. Say, hey, we're not going to give you any ro money for roads anymore. We're not going to give you any money for education or this or that or the other program. Oh, by the way, unconstitutional programs. The federal government's involved with in the first place. So the states have to be willing to take the pain of losing some of those federal dollars and find other ways uh, to address that issue. They need to reject modern expansions of power via misrepresentations of the Commerce Clause, of the Welfare Clause, the Supremacy Clause, all those clauses that are used traditionally to violate the Constitution. They They need to regain state and citizen control over the runaway federal government. It can be done. And the encouraging thing to me is that we see in America some indicators that it is being done. I mentioned the Sagebrush Rebellion, number one, during uh, the Reagan's uh, term. Then there was the Sagebrush Rebellion in the 90s. Both of those failed because they were satisfied with just getting the federal government to tinker with the details of how it was going to control land and how onerous it's obligated, you know, all those kind of things. They were just tinkering with a mechanism. What I see taking place now is a recognition by many people that the entire mechanism is broken, the entire mechanism is unconstitutional, and that rebellion, sagebrush rebellion, or I would say constitutional restoration, that constitutional restoration can put the federal government back in the box regarding these uh, specific issues. Which brings us back to the most important question of all. And that question is, what is the purpose of government? In fact, this should be your first question that you ask somebody running for office, whether they're running for county commissioner, or whether they're running or, or county council, or running for sheriff, or they're running for uh, state, or whatever position, or federal government. You need to ask them, what is the purpose of government? And if you know that the Declaration says there is one creator, almighty, sovereign God of the universe who created all things, including every human being, and that creator has given to us God given rights. And that the sole purpose of government, the third thing, the sole purpose of government is to protect and secure those God-given rights. And so if we understand that that is the purpose of government, we need to ask the question, what business does civil government have owning any land? 
Not just the federal government. What about the state of Maryland? What justification does the civil government have for owning any land? Well, I think the only way to answer that question is to ask, ask this one. Does ownership of land by state government, county government, whatever level of government, does ownership of land comport with the sole purpose of civil government to secure and protect the God-given rights of the citizens? Well, your answer should be, yeah, there are some land ownerships that, yeah, would make sense. That it would make sense that they own a court building, a, a, a city hall, a, a various other structures. would make sense because those structures and the ownership of those structures would contribute to the protection and the security of our God-given rights. But you see, we need to recognize that government in general shouldn't own large tracts of land, whether it's federal, state, or, or local government. It should be in the hands of private individuals because it's not their job, it's not their purpose to run parks, whether state parks or county parks or federal. No, that's not the purpose of God. What's that got to do with securing my God-given rights to life, liberty, and property? Nothing. Yes, individuals might band together and form a park association or something like that, but it could far better be done by individual ownership rather than state ownership. One of the reasons why the federal government began to uh, control property is it was in debt. It was deep in debt. After the War for American Independence, the first War for American Independence, the government was so deep in debt that it could not pay the soldiers who fought in that war. And so instead of paying them in hard cash, what it did is paid them in land. Because, and I read the story of the development of a federal park up in that part of New Jersey. It was going to be Tox Island Dam. They were going to build this dam, dam up the Delaware River and create this big lake. And the lake was going to swallow up a lot of very productive farms along the banks of the Delaware River. And the interesting thing about those farms is the farms were granted to Revolutionary War soldiers in payment for their service. And you know what the federal government did? By eminent domain and came and kicked out the families generations later, many generations later, who'd lived on that land, farmed that land, developed that land, took them off of that property by eminent domain and said, no, 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 that property belongs to the federal government now. We're going to build this dam and create this lake, which, by the way, they never did. For some reason, the project went, and you know what happened? The property never went back to those families of Revolutionary War soldiers. Private ownership of property is what God's design is, not government owning property. Therefore, does owning land somehow protect the life, liberty, or property of their citizens? That should be the question on all levels of government. Just a picture again to give you an idea of how vast the holdings are here in these 50 states of of uh, federal government lands. That's not to compare the state ownership of lands in addition. You would fill in the picture quite a bit more. Uh, Secretarial Order 13, uh, 3310 back in December 22nd called the Wildlands. We're going to create Wildlands. If you're familiar with the Biodiversity and Wildlands Project USA, this is the plan for those who want to put human beings in cages, essentially. Those few areas there that are not red or yellow are where human beings will be permitted to live if they have their purpose accomplished. They basically, they will take the human beings and put them in cages and let the wild lands roam free. And you could travel between these human islands on very narrow corridors where you're permitted to go from one place to another. And you can see the vast majority of our country would be swallowed up and controlled by the government, and you would not be able to set one foot on it. That is their plan which is why I think Obama's moving forward with the Wildlands Project. Let's gobble up more and more land and lock it away uh, from any human use whatsoever. That is not the purpose of government. That's the purpose of a tyrant, which is why our country was founded. We were founded to reject the tyranny of King George III and all his violations of God's law and to protect the God-given rights of the citizen. The purpose of government question is one that should be on the forefront of our minds in every issue we deal with, with our federal government. And you and I, as citizens of these United States and citizens specifically of this state in Maryland, can be part of the great movement of restoring our constitutional republic. Thank you.